Helen, thank you very much for reading for us. Um, let me pray. Hey, gracious Father, we've sung that and prayed that your uh, word uh, would indeed be a, a light to a, a lamp to our feet, a light to our path. We pray this morning that you would help us hear it aright. Uh, direct our steps, we pray, for Christ's sake. Amen. Well, do keep uh, Hebrews 12 open in front of you. We'll, we will get to Deuteronomy uh, in a moment. But uh, before we do, uh, I'd just like to take a step back uh, and ask, I suppose, what is a pretty fundamental question about Trinity, about Sunday mornings, uh, and about what we do on Sundays. And ask the question, what is it exactly that we are doing week by week, week as, as we meet, as we open our Bibles together? as we open the scriptures, as we hear them being read, as we reflect on them, as we think about them, as we try to understand them as well as we can. What is it that we're doing? It's an important question, I think, to, to ask some of these basic things from time to time. What is it we're doing and why are we doing it? That's important too. Why do we bother ourselves so much with words? And such old words, written so long ago, to people in such a different place and different age to ours. I mean, aren't there better things that we could be doing with ourselves on Sundays than thinking so much about words? Many people think so. Uh, many uh, Christians think so, that there are better things than we could be doing. And they put their focus elsewhere when they meet, concentrate on other things, things they consider to be more important than just words. And that's usually done in the hope that it will deepen their Christian experience. So they spend their time focusing on that. Lack of confidence in words is widespread. I, I don't know if you saw this from uh, the papers uh, a month or so ago. I think it was uh, The Guardian. Uh, homilies are, are the Roman Catholic equivalent to, to Protestant sermons, I suppose. Uh, and as you see, Pope Francis uh, issued a statement telling priests to keep their homilies as short as possible, or short, as people fall asleep. Words can be soporific, can't they? And therefore speaking should be limited to eight minutes because attention is lost, he said. Well, my first response to that is don't get your hopes up. The second thing to say is that it does suggest a lack of confidence in words, doesn't it? I was listening recently to a talk by John Woodhouse, an Australian pastor and preacher. And he was saying how in the early days of the Christian church, they were sometimes, churches were sometimes mistaken for philosophical societies. Such things existed in the first century where groups of people got together to discuss ideas, to think about words. And some people, knowing a little bit about Christians, not a lot, but a little, knowing what they did when they got together, the sort of things they got up to, they mistook churches for philosophical societies because it, they looked more to them like philosophical societies than the religious groups of the day. They didn't do what religious people did. They didn't meet in special buildings, anything that might be mistaken for a temple. They didn't have a special class or caste of people or priests, and they weren't really concerned with ceremonies and rituals at all. In fact, they didn't really look religious at all. But they were concerned about words, very concerned about words, hence a confusion. But they weren't, of course, philosophical societies any more than we are. Why? Because though they were concerned to hear and think about words, as are we, there was a difference, a profound one. When they gathered, as indeed when we gather, the words we're concerned to think about are the words of God. And that makes all the difference. All the difference in the world. So if you glance down briefly at Hebrews 12, you, you probably noticed it was read to us that a contrast, uh, a comparison and a contrast is being made between Israel, God's people in the past, 
and Christians, God's people then and today. So verse 18, Israel at the time of Moses, rescued from Egypt, gathered at Mount Sinai, hear the voice of God. Now we're not told all the details, we don't know exactly what that was like, I'm sure it was a northern accent, uh, but we're not told. We are told, however, that it was a terrifying experience. So terrifying, in fact, that the people begged not to hear it and asked for Moses to step in and be the intermediary. They didn't want to hear God themselves. They wanted Moses to tell them what God had said. That was Israel then. The contrast here in Hebrews 12 is between Israel back then and Christians now. Christians who've not come to a mountain, but to Jesus. And as we hear and learn what Jesus has done for us through the pages of scripture, God speaks to us through what he says about Jesus in the Bible. And so verse 25, which is just the one verse really I want to underline for the moment, the writer of the Hebrew says, see to it that you do not refuse him who speaks. If they did not escape when they refused him who warned him on earth, how much less we, if we turn away from him who warns us from heaven. Don't refuse him who speaks. Not me, of course. But God, hear and heed him. So what we do Sunday by Sunday is of huge significance and importance. Uh, Not only on Sundays, uh, I trust and hope that what we do on Sundays, uh, we're doing in essence uh, uh, other times of the week as well. But week by week, as we open the scriptures, as we concern ourselves with words, we are concerning ourselves and listening to God's word. God's word to us. And that makes some very important words because they're God's words. And so we want to spend time listening to that word as it is read, as it is preached. And the important thing, of course, is not that the person up front, whether they're a particularly skillful speaker, an an entertaining speaker, whether they can tell funny stories, make us laugh, amuse us with cultural references that go way over our head. That's not the important bit. That's just bubble. That's just froth. Helpful if it helps us focus on the words and illuminates their meaning, but unhelpful if not. Just froth, bubble. What matters are the words of God, that he has caused to be written for us to hear today. All of which is by way of an overlong, I suspect, introduction to Deuteronomy. So if you'd like to turn back to Deuteronomy chapter 1, I haven't got the page, I'm afraid. Um, It's sort of about half an inch in, I think. Um, Thank you, 178. Now, I guess Deuteronomy is a book that's not over-familiar to most of us. Note, though, will you, at the first opening four words, verse 1. The book of Deuteronomy is all about words. Now, I guess most books are full of words, aren't they? I mean, not many of Lottie's books are full of words, to be honest, but most books are full of words. And Deuteronomy is full of words. More than that, it's full of words about words. Deuteronomy has a lot to say about God's words. And that's what makes it worthy of our time. Note how it begins. These are the words that Moses spoke. Deuteronomy, it's the fifth book of Moses, the last book of the Pentateuch. Um, It's actually had a number of names over the years. Uh, one of those, one of those Hebrews title for the book is actually taken from those opening words. These are the words. That was what the book was called. These are the words. A book of words about words. The words that Moses spoke. And you're probably aware there's quite a lot of them. 
it's a long book. It's basically made, mainly made up of three speeches, three long speeches that Moses made in the wilderness to Israel east of the Jordan. So the first one begins in chapter 1 at verse 5, uh, and that continues to the end of chapter 4. We'll look at that more next week. The next one's a real whopper. It goes from chapter 5 all the way through to chapter 28. That might take us more than a week. And the third one is much shorter, verses 29 to 30. So three speeches. We do get some other bits in the book. We hear a bit about Moses' death and burial. We hear a bit about the leaders who are to follow him. But the bulk of the book are those three speeches, words of Moses to Israel. Important words, pretty much his last words. I wonder, you know, if you were there that day, sitting on the ground, on your ground sheet, leaning against your staff in the heat, were they interested, do you think, to hear the old man again? Perhaps they'd had initially other plans for that day. Perhaps they'd rather be elsewhere. Perhaps they were distracted by their phones. If so, what they needed to understand was... What they were hearing was not just words of an old man whose time had nearly come. They were not just his words, verse 3, do you see? In the 40th year, on the first day of the 11th month, Moses proclaimed to the Israelites all that the Lord had commanded him concerning them. Moses' words, Moses' speeches, not just his to Israel in the wilderness east of the Jordan, They're God's words. Words of Moses that the Lord had commanded him to speak to them. Do you reckon that raises the stakes a bit? They should stop scrolling, put down their phones, pick up their ears and listen to what Moses, to what God had to say to them. Now, before we go on, it would be helpful, I think, to remind us just where we are in Israel's story, Um, just where they are as as the book opens. I I don't know, does that vaguely see that? Does that work? Um, I don't know. We'll see. Anyway, uh, you'll recognize it's the Middle East, isn't it? So the first bit up there is Goshen. That's the bit in Egypt where Israel was before they were rescued from Egypt. Uh, They travel initially, follow the red line. Uh, They rescue from Egypt. They go down to... Mount Sinai, Mount Horeb, down there. Then uh, having been there for a a while, they then travel north up to uh, the border of the Promised Land, at Kadesh Barnea, and then they move round to X marks the plot on the east of the Promised Land. Or, uh, if you prefer, um, in the wilderness, east of Jordan, opposite Suf, between Param, Tophes, Laban, Heroth, and Nizanab, if that's easier for you. Israel is there, camped east of the Jordan, ready to enter Canaan, the promised land, listening to Moses. But they're still outside it. So if we zoom in, they're on the eastern border of the promised land, but they're outside it still. They're not there yet. So as a book opens, they're in the wilderness. To be in the wilderness, to be in the desert, is to be outside the promised land. Are we nearly there yet? Nearly, but not yet. So as Deuteronomy opens, the desert experience of the people of God, which becomes an important theme in the book and the rest of the Bible, well, they're still there. They're still in the wilderness east of the Jordan. That's where they are. But why are they still there? Why are they still in the desert, still outside the land, nearly but not yet there? Well, we'll come to that in a moment. But before we do, I wonder if you're not beginning to think or uh, experience 
in your mind a bit of a problem that we've got. You could call it the so what problem or the Catherine Tate problem. Am I bothered? Should I be bothered? So what? Why should I be concerned that they're still there in the wilderness? I mean, listening to Moses, I mean, I hear what you say, Martin. I hear what you say, that it, it, Moses' words to them were God's words to them. And I can see that it was relevant to them. And I can see how pe people like Mary Beard and Tom Holland, people who are interested in this ancient history sort of thing, I can see that this might float their boat, but why should it float mine? It's a good question, isn't it? I mean, it's an important question, a really important question. It's actually one we have every time we open the Bible, isn't it? But it seems even more acute in some parts of the Bible than others, and Deuteronomy is probably one of them. Why should I be bothered? Well, hold on to that question at the moment, will you? And notice verse 2. Perhaps the first puzzle of the book. Verse 2. It takes 11 days to go from Mount Horeb to Karnesh Barnea by the Mount Seir Road. So I'm tempted to try the screen. Uh, there. Oh, yes, okay. So Mount Sinai at the bottom. It takes 10, 11 days to get to the southern border of the Promised Land. Horeb and Mount Sinai, it's two names for the same place, just to confuse us. So you can see where Kardash Barnier is, a trip of 11 days from Mount Sinai. A road trip of 11 days has taken 40 years. 40 years to do a journey of 11 days. Are we nearly there yet? I mean, that's some delay, isn't it? and calls for some explanation. Heavy traffic? Roadworks? Nope. We'll get more details next week, but for now, suffice to say, they were diverted. When they arrived at Karnesh Barnea, there was a series of events that had enormous consequences. In short, God said to them, we're at the promised land, I've got this. Go in, take it, it's yours. And they said, no. They refused to believe God's word to them. They refused to obey God's word to them. And God said, okay, have it your own way. And so Israel stayed where they were in the desert until pretty much all of them who were there that day and refused to go in had died. So we're now 40 years on in the desert, east of the Jordan, outside the land. And Moses addresses the next generation. None of those who were listening there that day had been at Sinai, had been at Mount Horeb, when God had spoken to them. None had witnessed the rescue from Egypt. None had actually traveled to Kadesh Barnea for that 11 days. So can you see, I hope you can see that in at least one respect, the people there that day listening to Moses are similar to us. They have a similar problem of relevance. Why should they be bothered? Why should they be bothered what God said to their ancestors back then, 40 years ago? It's a say what question. I mean, it was such a long time ago. I, I can remember when I realised, okay, true, true um, transparent silks, full, full exposure, whatever. I was born in 1962. When I was growing up, the Second World War seemed ages ago. 17 years. It had been over. There in the desert, 40 years ago, it's a long time, especially if it's 40 years in the desert. Especially if every day was wandering around. Why should it matter to them what God said back then at Mount Sinai so long ago? Well, Moses' words to this second generation, as they stand on the borders of the land, his speeches to them then, that we'll go on to look at, 
look on over the next few weeks, will address that very question. Moses' words to them are all about what God said in the past and why it should concern them. What he'd done in the past and why that should concern them. All he had said and done, why those words still mattered. True, yes, they hadn't been in Egypt. They hadn't seen God's mighty acts of power firsthand. And true, they hadn't been there at Sinai. They'd not seen the clouds. They'd not heard the voice. They'd not felt the ground shudder. But look again at verse 3, will you? Moses proclaimed to the Israelites all that the Lord had commanded him concerning them. And verse 5, east of the Jordan, in the territory of Moab, Moses began to expound the law, saying, The Lord our God said to us at Horeb. They'd not been there. But God had been speaking to them. Do you see how what God has said in the past to their forebears, he'd also said to them? His words spoken in the past to their forebears, he'd also spoken to them his words spoken before they were born were words for them and what they need more than anything else was an explanation or an exposition of that word which is what Moses now goes on to provide why why did they need that more than anything else well because if God has spoken If he has a word for you, you must listen. The God who is there, who is the creator and sustainer of everything, who sent his son into the world, if that God has spoken, well, there are at least two fundamental implications, aren't there? And if you're taking notes, put these two things down in capital letters and undermine them. And if you're not taking notes, take a pen from someone who is, And if you're old school, write it on your cuff. If you're smart casual, or even casual, write it on the back of your hand. Okay, two things. Two implications. If God has spoken, one, we must listen. We must take that word seriously. And the second implication comes from that, really. The second implication, if God has spoken, we have a really clear diagnostic test for true and false religion you see if God has spoken true religion if we're going to use that term is to hear and heed that word and false religion is to seek God elsewhere Now, the two, of course, can get mixed up. True religion can get contaminated, which is why when anyone ever speaks or claims to speak the truth about God, the test is always, what does the scripture say? If God has spoken to us in scripture, which Jesus insisted he had, true religion is to hear and heed it. False religion is to seek to know God and experience God apart from listening to that word. So when people concoct their own religions, their own ceremonies, their own rituals, in an attempt to have an experience of God apart from that word, which people do all the time, they do, of course, have an experience. You can't deny the experience. But whatever they make, suppose it's not an experience of God's. Although, of course, if you carry on doing it for long enough, whole generations will grow up believing that they are. That in performing certain rituals and ceremonies, having certain experiences, that that's the way to experience and know God. Religion will give you an experience, but not of God, because it's not based on the reality of the true God who has spoken. It will be an experience, well, based on make-believe, really. We hear God, we encounter God, we experience God by hearing, understanding, and heeding that word. And, you know, it's possible to create other experiences, of course, a whole variety of them. Uh, Folk do it all the time, churches do it all the time. Perhaps churches especially do it all the time, I don't know. How long have you been knocking around Christian circles? I don't know. Some of us a long time, some of us not that long. 
Depending on how long you've been knocking around, you will have seen this manifest itself in various ways. Back in the day, it was supposed, and when I say back in the day, 50, 60 years ago or something, 50 years probably, um, there was the idea knocking around uh, that you had a deeper experience of God if you spoke in tongues. That somehow it would be deeper, closer, more direct, more personal. Now, interest in, in tongues is much less than it was now. It's still around, but you have to go hunting for it more. Because that was replaced by a different focus, I think, probably, and that was on healing. The, the idea of people travelled the world, Morris Cirillo came to London with his healing crusades, and it was said, it was said that God was doing a new thing. It always usually comes with that idea. He's doing a new thing in our age, and his power could be experienced and seen in mighty acts of healing. And there were huge... Um, meetings and, and things held in Earl's Court and, and elsewhere. The underlying assumption was that by directly witnessing God at work in this way would bring a deeper experience of God. And again, although it's still around if you go looking for it, and of course God can heal anyone of anything, he raised the dead after all, it became clear even to the most enthusiastic folk that the claims didn't stack up. So it sort of faded away. And I reckon it's been replaced more in more recent years with the idea of prophecy. That again, God is doing a new thing in a new way, has a new word for us. And if you can tune into it, you too can receive a word from God, a more direct word, a more personal word. God has a special word for me, for you, for that church, for this church. And people imagine that they can have a deeper, uh, more personal experience of God if they, if they seek after this. And experience which they receive God, an individual word from God. And again, it's probably less than it was a few years ago, but it's still, still around big time, I reckon. In perhaps more subtle ways. But do you see how in all these cases, folk are looking for and striving for a deeper experience of God, and however sincere, they are very seriously wrong, looking in the wrong place. You see, if God has spoken, if God has spoken, you cannot get a more real experience of God than hearing his word. If God has spoken, and for the avoidance of doubt, he has, don't go looking for an experience of God somewhere else. Don't go around trying to create an experience and then call the experience that you've had an experience of God. Don't create rituals and ceremonies or practices and rites or manipulate atmospheres in which you imagine you get close to God. No, if God has spoken, hear what he's got to say. Heed what he's got to say. Well, I must close uh, two very quick things from these verses that will develop more in coming weeks, very quickly, about the words that Moses expounded back then. First note, will you? What Moses expounds has to do with what had happened in the past, back at Horeb, at Mount Sinai. See verse 6? The Lord our God said to us at Horeb, but notice, as I said, I think I said already, notice who God is speaking to. He's speaking to those who were not at Horeb. I mean, a few were toddlers at the time, too young to understand. But pretty much everyone else who was there is now dead. Moses' message to those in front of him that day, east of the Jordan, in the wilderness, was, if you want to know what God has to say to you today, you need to know what he said back then. Why? Because see, what he said at Horeb to them is what he's got to say to you today. Same thing. Really important principle to grasp. Perhaps that's the third thing we should be underlining. The second quick and equally fundamental thing. Do you notice verse 8? As we begin to what, listen to what Moses is saying, notice that it's all to do with God's promises that he'd made in the past. See, I give you this land. Go in and take possession of the land. The Lord swore he would give your fathers and to their descendants. Go in and take the promised land, the land of promise. So actually, what he said at Horeb 
pointed back even further to their past, to Abraham, many years earlier, where he'd promised, Genesis 12, 15, etc., to bring Abraham's descendants to a land, to make them into a great nation, and to bless them, and to, through them, bring blessings to all nations. That was God's purpose. His purpose he expressed in a promise. And the history of the world has been the movement of God towards a fulfillment of that promise ever since. It all has to do with his promises and purposes. And the promise he made to Abraham is what the New Testament calls, Galatians 3, verse 8, the gospel announced in advance. The promise to God in Abraham back then must have seemed like ancient history, mustn't it, to those in the wilderness that day? But the words that he'd spoken to Abraham back then, like the words he'd spoken at Sinai, like the words he was speaking to them in the wilderness east of Jordan, like are words that he still speaks to his people today, wherever they are, because they're the words of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we'll see in coming weeks, I hope, if you come back, with increasing clarity just how Deuteronomy will speak of Jesus and the promises that God has made to us through him. But for now... May we all grasp that God's words to them in the past are still his words to us today. And the call remains the same. See to it that you do not refuse him who speaks. Hear his words. Trust his words. Heed his words. Well, may God give us the grace to say to do. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we are amazed and thankful that you are a God who is not only there, but who is not silent. Thank you that you have spoken to us in the scriptures and through your Son. May we be those who hear, understand, and obey for Christ's sake. Amen. Amen.